The greatest crime ever committed by football fans was believing that Pele would have no chance if he played nowadays. It's easy to look back and smugly say, he couldn't do that today. Well, in the future, the players of today will be seen in the same light. Your kids will listen to you tell them about the great Messi and his 91 goals in a season and they'll tell you, huh, in La Liga, anyone could do that, he'd struggle to put up 10 goals in a Super League. But well, you tell me, do you think that if Messi was born 10 years from now, then in 2050 he would struggle? Personally, I have no doubt it would be as deadly as ever. And the same applies to Pele. If he had been born the same year as Messi, he would have been up there with him fighting for every award. He was a player so prodigious, such a freak of nature that people's admiration for him changed Brazil forever, stopped civil war in Nigeria, created a new holiday in Congo, forced the Americans to watch football and the Argentinians to clap for him. When they say Pele is the king of football, it is not just a mere compliment, he is simply, without a doubt, football's sovereign ruler, the one who came before all, the king of kings. Erasing him from the history of football would cause the entire landscape of the sport to change in a way nobody else could imitate. So now that he's gone, I beg you, if you doubt his greatness even a little bit, please just watch this video till the end. This is the story of how Pele became the king of football. His real name was Edson. People only began calling him Pelé because he mispronounced the name of a famous goalkeeper, Bile. He didn't even like the name, he picked fights with the kids who called him that all the time and even as an adult he insisted the nickname sounded too childish. But no matter what, it stuck. If it's already hard not to fall in love with football when you're born in Brazil, it was even harder for Pelé, whose dad was literally a football player. If you asked anyone who saw his dad play, they'd insist he was even better than Pelé. In fact, if you asked Pelé, he would tell you himself that his father, Dondinho, was, to me, the best player in the world. Still, they didn't have much. Things got really bad really easily. One time his father got injured and the club stopped paying him. So Pele, hearing that they were struggling for money, went downtown and began shining shoes for a few pennies. I guess you're expecting a story about how all of this trauma led Pele to overcome poverty by giving all that he could on the pitch. But that was not the case at all. Pele was always oddly optimistic about Brazil. To him, a little kid with no way of seeing the world, Brazil was the best country in the world, the most beautiful in the world and he never wanted to go anywhere else. But the thing is, at that age, Pele was already something else. At just 13, the youth team he represented was so dominant that they already made it into the newspapers every week, winning matches by absurd margins like 21-0 in one occasion with Pele being the star every single time, drawing huge crowds just to see him play and eventually being forbidden by the league from playing up front as it was too unfair for the other kids. This led him to move on to playing futsal among full-grown adults where, in his first tournament, they insisted on repeatedly benching him because he was too young and somehow despite his age and the lack of minutes, he still went on to be the top scorer. At this point, believe it or not, the offers came left, right and center, but his mom was super protective of her little boy and insisted he should live a normal life with the family. However, one of his coaches, Valdemar Brito, was so convinced that he was, in his own words, the greatest player to ever live, that he begged the mother to let him take the kid to Santos and eventually she gave in. The moment he arrived at Santos, it was like the air became lighter. A scout came to greet him and as he said himself, he gripped my hand with such strength, I immediately knew I would want him by my side. And soon enough, they had handed him a professional contract. At times, it seems Pele proved that destiny is real and football was his. At first, they tried putting him in the B squad. After all, we are talking about a 15-year-old, but then he scored 13 goals in his first 13 matches and nothing was ever the same. They just had to play him with the grown-ups, at the very least to see once and for all if he was human, and to make sure one of the dozens of teams already promising him the world in exchange for his signature couldn't take him away. In his very first game, he scored. In his first tournament, despite once again the club insisting on benching him, he was the top scorer. One month later, the newspapers were demanding his call-up to the national team, and one month after that, he was debuting for Brazil. He was still only 16, and had been a professional player for only 10 months. 
With his call-up, his place in the starting 11 at Santos became completely bulletproof, which allowed him to finish the year as the Paulista Championship's top scorer with 17 goals. Here's where I need to start a little tangent. The year before Pele debuted, the top scorer of the Paulista had scored 16 goals. The most anyone had ever managed at that point was 39. Well, on his second season for Santos, around the time he was turning 17 years old, Pele scored 58. Obviously making Santos state champions for only the second time in their history and immediately becoming a legend and attracting all sorts of interest from around the world. It's incredible to think that just three years earlier, he was shining shoes on the street. And if any of this was already incredibly impressive, then came the 1958 World Cup, which took him from being one of the most impressive wonder kids in history and made him, by far, without a shadow of a doubt, the greatest. All of it had happened so suddenly that as he traveled to Sweden where the tournament would be played, Pele was leaving Brazil for just the first time in his life. In fact, the federation almost decided against calling him up after a psychologist had him perform some tests and concluded he was not responsible enough to play in a tournament of such high stakes, that he was too childish and didn't realize the importance of it all. However, according to his teammate Zagalo, that was exactly what made him so special. It made him absurdly confident, which obviously could seem foolish, it was a 17-year-old playing in a World Cup, but then he justified that confidence through the way he played. Regardless, at first, both him and Garrincha were left out of the squad and it wasn't until the third match against the Soviet Union, a match that Brazil had to win in order to go through, that the players supposedly cornered the coach and forced him to play them, which not only made Pele the youngest ever player to play at a World Cup, but also allowed them to assist one of the goals that put Brazil in the quarter finals. There, Pele would be even more decisive, scoring the only goal of the match, an incredible acrobatic effort that was considered by some newspapers at the time as the most beautiful goal of the tournament. But if scoring a single World Cup goal at the age of 17 wasn't mind-blowing enough, then Pele pulled off the impossible, going head-to-head -head with Just Fontaine, who would break the World Cup's goal-scoring record with 13 goals that very same year, and still, Pele completely outshined him, pulling off a hat-trick to leave the French team completely in the dust and seal Brazil's spot in the final. Ironically, the final would be precisely against Sweden, the hosts of the tournament, who to make it all worse, would score first. Still, while the other players had flashbacks of 1950 when Brazil lost the World Cup final in their home ground, Pele remembered what he promised his dad that day. Don't worry, soon I will win the World Cup myself. Even though Pele was not the one to score to turn the game around, he would score Brazil's third, lifting the ball over a defender and then volleying it in goal and their fifth as the match ended 5-2, giving Brazil the title of World Cup champions. Pele had by far been the revelation of the tournament, being considered the second best player, only rated below DD. But his naivety persevered. According to himself, as they flew home, he wondered if at least his parents had seen the goals he scored. Well, little did he know, everyone in the entire country had. The moment he stepped foot on Brazil, he was welcomed like a hero. From there on out, he was the most admired, the most loved man in Brazil. As someone once said, every dad wanted Pele to be his son, every girl wanted Pele to be their boyfriend, every boy wished they were Pele instead. Pele was the image of Brazil. He was football's first superstar. His name could sell any product and in the blink of an eye, he had become football's first millionaire. Back at Santos, everything changed as well. Before Pele had signed for them, they weren't exactly the biggest, only one trophy in their nearly 50 years of existence. However, that one trophy had come exactly in the year before he arrived. The timing seemed too perfect. It was like their greatest ever team was waiting for their greatest ever player. And as they once said, it was like God himself had put that team together. Regardless, the next year they actually failed to win the Paulista, even though they were quite clearly the best team in the world. Going on a tour around Europe, destroying the likes of Barcelona 5-1 and impressing so much against Inter that their fans gave Pele a standing ovation. Leading Santiago Bernabeu himself to meet with Pele to try to arrange his signing as a replacement for the great Raimond Copa. But despite the rumors that Santos even agreed on a price, Real never triggered it. 
It was also that year that Pele scored the best goal of his career, lobbing the ball over two defenders and then the goalkeeper without ever letting it touch the ground, and though this particular goal wasn't recorded, a plaque was placed in the stadium to immortalize it. To everyone who saw it, it was the most beautiful goal in history. By 1961, Pele would experience the most prolific year of his career, totaling 110 goals. By then, Pele was so feared and respected in Europe that when Olympiacos managed to beat Santos 2-1, it was seen as such an achievement that a line was added to the club's anthem where they mentioned the fact they had beat them. Regardless, nothing marked that year more than Pele being at the center of a massive transfer saga that saw Inter, Milan and Juventus all battle for his signing, offering up to 600 million lira for the player, around 355,000 pounds at the time, more than double what anyone had paid for any player in history. And in fact, Inter was keen on offering even more money if needed, but they feared the reaction of the public too much, who already found this value to be close to obscene. Had it gone through, it would have been the greatest increase to the transfer record in history. However, at the time, Janio Quadros was the president of Brazil, and let's just say, he wasn't very popular, he had literally outlawed bikinis in Brazil, and well, he feared that if he allowed Pele to leave it would have been his last strike at the eyes of the Brazilian population, so in an act of desperation he amended the few laws and declared Pele a living, breathing human as the national treasure, meaning that not only it would be illegal to sell him to a foreign club, but also that he was forbidden from leaving the country without the permission of the government. Regardless, at that point, Pele didn't have much reason to complain. Santos did not just claim they were the best team on the planet, they had proven it, beating European champions Benfica in the Intercontinental Cup by 8-4 on aggregate, with Pele scoring 5 himself in what was one of the most dominant performances in his career and established that year as his absolute peak, setting the expectations for the World Cup at an all-time high. And at first, it all went well. A goal and an assist against Mexico in the opening match set the tone and then the second match against Czechoslovakia was going well until Pele went for a long range shot and was then seen limping out of nowhere. Nowadays, maybe we wouldn't have been so worried. Oh, okay, he's limping, take him out, spray him with painkillers, rest him till the next match, he'll be fine. But in, in 1962, you were not even allowed to make substitutions. Pele was forced to endure the pain and play until the end of the match. But then, nothing more. Once the final whistle was heard, it became evident immediately that Pele was out of the World Cup, which was quite simply the most bittersweet experience of his career, as he had to sit and watch from the stands like a regular fan as Brazil went on to become world champions once again. Still, Pele was always an optimist, and as hard as it might be to visualize, winning those World Cups had taken Brazil from a country who had lost any drop of self-love they had left to a roaring nation who never hesitated to celebrate itself, and for a while it all seemed great, until the military took over the country, starting one of the darkest eras in the country's history. The events of the World Cup added to this, added to his unsuccessful marriage and the pressure of the Brazilian population for the players to bring home a third World Cup title way down on Pele and very soon you could notice the light in his eyes starting to fade. He was not the same bright-eyed kid the world had fallen in love with. He went into a slump, never really getting the numbers he was getting before the World Cup and even though he was 21 and even though it was that same year that he broke the 500 gold mark, he would get the feeling that he wasn't the same anymore. However, that obviously did not mean he wasn't good, Pele on half power was still by far the best on the planet. Despite missing out on the Paulista, Santos went on to revalidate their Copa Libertadores title with Pele scoring 4 out of the 5 semi-final goals against Botafogo and then getting another in the final versus Boca before also impressing in the Intercontinental Cup once again, despite being out injured for the second and third leg as Santos came back to steal the title from AC Milan's grasp. By 1965, Santos had completely established their dominance over the Brazilian Cup, winning it for a fifth consecutive time. However, their tours began getting a little out of hand. Being humiliated conceding 10 goals in two matches versus Penharol and Independiente, which led the newspapers to begin mocking them, saying their players had become divas who were more concerned with traveling than actually playing good football. 
In a way, this added to the fact that the 1966 World Cup was getting closer and closer, seemed to fire up Pele to go on one of the most incredible runs of his career, finishing the year with 96 goals at one point, getting so irritated that a smaller team who had been bragging about how they had beaten Santos in the absence of Pele, who was injured for the first match, that he took revenge on them by scoring 8 goals in a single match. And on another occasion, against a completely different team, Pele made it till halftime without scoring and then heard the rival players say, I thought we came to see the king, where is the king? And well, do I even need to say it, Pele took revenge again, scoring 6 goals in the second half. With performances of this level, he leapfrogged a couple milestones and reached the 700 gold mark at only 25 years of age. Once again, in the form of his life, it seemed he was destined to take over the World Cup once more. And still disturbed by what happened in 1962, this time around, he wasn't just motivated, he was obsessed. He felt he had to win the World Cup, a victory in England, the birthplace of football, a record third World Cup in his heart. He felt it would have been the perfect time to call it quits. That was the plan, to win and retire, even though he was only 25. But unfortunately, as soon as the tournament started, his entire outlook changed. People only talked about one thing. Pele had forced football to adapt. Players were now much more rough. This time around, if the defenders couldn't get the ball off of Pele, they would get Pele off of the ball. There are literally reports of him being fouled up to 17 times per match. In the first game he went down and down again and still pulled off the miracle through a free kick, with Garrincha also scoring in that same match, which was extra special since it would be the last time the two greats would play together, ending their partnership without losing a single one of the 40 matches they took part in. Regardless, after that first game, Pele was so beat up that he had to sit out the one that came next, and though he was brought back for the third group stage match against Portugal, they were well aware of how other teams had managed to stop Pele. So so the answer was obvious, they had to hit Pele until he was out, it was the only way to stop him, and so that's what they did, and with Eusebio left unchallenged, it was a bloodbath and quickly turned into one of the saddest days in Pele's career, being kicked out of the World Cup by one of his greatest rivals. However, things would get much more shocking when he surprised everyone saying, I have no luck at the World Cup, it's the second time that I'm out after just two games, I've decided I won't play another one ever again. It was already odd that he considered retiring so early in case he won, but doing so after going out so miserably was 10 times more disappointing. From here on out, if the constant touring already seemed to distance Pele from Brazil, now it completely separated him from it. It seemed almost at times that he was avoiding some painful memories. Regardless, his African tour brought us some of his most iconic moments. In Congo, he was escorted to the match in a convertible, waving at the people like he was the Pope. Once there, the Congolese national team was so determined to beat Santos, they replayed the match three different times and when they finally managed to beat him, the the players dropped to the floor in euphoria and that moment became so pivotal in Congo sports history that to this day it is a national holiday. In the same vein they also played in Nigeria, which was literally in the middle of a civil war, but still everyone was so excited to see him play that a ceasefire was declared the moment Pele stepped inside the country. It got crazy to the point that some of his teammates have claimed in interviews that while they were there they did not hear a single gunshot, but the moment the plane took off they could hear them in the distance once again. Just as the war had stopped the moment Pele arrived, it restarted the moment he left. Still, at that point, all around, everywhere, things only seemed to get worse. Always away from Brazil, Pele heard the news on the radio, one crime against humanity after the other, the dictatorship in Brazil had hit levels like never before. Even he wasn't safe there anymore, barely going out on the street for years. It was expected that his retirement would come sometime soon and by 1969, Pele hit a special mark, 999 goals one more to hit 1000. It was the perfect time to quit. Why wouldn't he? It would be so easy to just say goodbye at that point. And well, 14 minutes into the game, Pele went down in the box and the referee pointed to the penalty spot. You could see the amazement in his eyes. The moment had arrived. Goal number 1000. Even the rival fans were yelling out his name. Everyone was just so convinced he'd score that his team had already ran back to their own half. And well, 
Of course he scored. Everyone invaded the pitch, the match was suspended for 20 minutes. It wasn't about the game anymore, it was about something much greater. It was the greatest achievement in football. A moment that defined the generation. Pele was the king of football. The man who scored 1000 goals. In the midst of all of this, no matter how much he thought about retiring, no matter how much he resented the possibility of playing another World Cup, once the government asked him to play, knowing what they were capable of, he was not willing to risk going through it. Understandable or not, his unwillingness to stand up against him ended up being a stain in his legacy. Regardless, as he said it himself, I was in a lot of anguish. The government always wanted me around, but I didn't want to play the World Cup. There was so much pressure, I didn't like being Pele anymore. If this was already a lot to deal with, before he even arrived in Mexico for the tournament, the news began circulating that a group of revolutionaries were planning his kidnapping in the same way Di Stefano had been kidnapped seven years earlier. From that moment on, there was not a single moment when Pele was not surrounded by bodyguards. Some even say that for a while they used a body double. And as Pele hoped that at least the football side of things would go well, Brazil entered their first match by conceding to Czechoslovakia. But then, suddenly, Pele became more lively, started rushing the defense and you could see something had changed. A simulation allowed Rivellino to score the first through a free kick, then Pele himself scored the magnificent volley to go in front and finally, he also added an assist to his tally. After starting the game without much hope, the Brazilians saw that Pele was back. And once they went on to beat world champions England in the second match, with a magnificent assist by Pele allowing Jairzinho to score the win the mood changed completely. To finish off the group stage, Pele dominated the match against Romania, scoring twice with a free kick at first and then a striker's goal to close the match. Suddenly Brazil seemed now completely revitalized and the following two matches were absolute demolition jobs, with Rivellino, Tustão, Jairzinho and Pelé combining for seven goals, with Pele also pulling off one of his most iconic skills, faking a dribble and going around the goalkeeper though unfortunately he would miss the open goal. But if by then it could be argued that Pele had been outshined by his teammates, in the final it was different. The match was against Italy, they had won two World Cups already, they were a powerhouse and it was 100% definitely Pele's last ever World Cup match. He was so nervous for the outcome that on his way there on the bus, he began crying uncontrollably, refusing to tell anyone why. As the anthem played in the stadium, he looked more tense than ever before. To anyone around him, it seemed disaster was coming, but instead, the opposite happened. 18 minutes in, Pele had already scored, leading to one of the most iconic celebrations of all time, with Jairzinho holding him up in the air. However, ever since the First World War, the fans claimed there was a curse. The team who opened the scoring had lost every single time, and once Italy equalized, the Brazilians feared the worst was coming. Regardless, it was then that Gerson pulled off an incredible long-range strike to put Brazil in front, which was then followed by Pele assisting both Jairzinho and Carlos Alberto to settle the result at 4-1, demolishing Italy to win his third World Cup title, a feat that was never again repeated. The same applies to Pele's six assists in a single tournament, the most anyone has ever managed. But still, despite all of that, when asked about what was the best part of winning the third World Cup, his answer was the relief. From there on out things began to fade away. Pele began threatening that he'd leave Santos over some contractual disputes. Domestically his numbers dropped massively, scoring just 7 in 40 matches in 1971, finally truly retiring from the national team that same year and leaving Santos 3 years after that. That moment, well, it should have been the last, but as Pele prepared to live a life outside of football, he asked his accountants to run an audit and he ended up realizing he was not as well off as he thought, after a series of investments had gone massively wrong. So like many players of that time, Pele was forced to come back from retirement after a little less than a year and go on one last journey trying to secure his future. His destination was the New York Cosmos, playing alongside the great Beckenbauer, 
What a duo. It's been claimed Pele was paid $5 million for a three-year contract. For comparison, the highest paid basketball player in the US at the time earned just 450 k a year. Pele completely took over a country that supposedly didn't even care for football. That's how much of a superstar he was. On his debut, there were 152 photographers following his every move. That's more than how many were present at Jimmy Carter's induction as the new United States president, and over his three years there, Cosmos averaged an attendance nearly four times higher than the rest of the clubs, and it all culminated in Pele's third and final season there as he carried them to the league title. He won until the very last second, scored over 1,200 goals, and ended it all by asking the crowd in the stadium to repeat one word with him three times. Love, love, love. 